Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for coming together to discuss this important topic. Lead us, teach us, and guide us. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So our topic of discussion is on anatomy and physiology 101. Anatomy and physiology is quite a large topic. And uh, however, the objective in this particular uh, discussion is looking at digestion from the mouth all the way through and seeking to understand that in terms of how um, the different organs interplay with each other to um, allow proper dis digestion and how we can actually gain the best from the foods we eat. So question one, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Psalm 139, 14. So closely is health related to our happiness that we cannot have the latter without the former. A practical knowledge of the science of human life is necessary in order to glorify God in our bodies. It is therefore of the highest importance that among the studies selected for childhood, physiology should occupy the first place. So physiology is quite important and we should sit and teach our young the, you know, in simple form, help them to understand the processes of physiology so that they too from an early age can make right choices. How few know anything about the structure and functions of their own bodies and of nature's laws. Many are drifting about without knowledge, like a ship at sea, without compass or anchor, and it is more. They, and what is more, they are not interested to learn how to keep their bodies in a healthy condition and prevent disease. It's amazing, but yet, it is important for us to learn how to keep our bodies in a healthy condition to prevent and to restore in the case of disease. Study that marvelous organism, the human system, and the laws by which it is governed. So we have here, um, you know, just identifying different parts of the body. It is so intricate, and there's so many different aspects of our body, each of them having their specific function and placed there by God, they are all interrelated and they do have their important work in helping our bodies to be well. So question three, what is, the, what is digestion? Digestion is the process of breaking down the food you consume into molecules that can be absorbed or passed through the body. The body uses these broken down molecules to make new cells and provide energy. So you need new cells to build up the body, build up muscle, build, you know, new cells for various functions and also to provide energy. That's what digestion would take the food and food provides this. So our bodies, are, question four, our bodies are constructed from what we eat and in order to make tissues of good quality, we must have the right kind of food and it must be prepared with such skill as will best adapt it to the wants of the system. It is a religious duty for those who cook to learn how to prepare healthful food in a variety of ways so that it may be both palatable and healthful. Poor Kikri is wearing away the life energies of thousands. So it's quite important. Now many souls are lost for this cause than many realize. It deranges the system and produces disease in the condition thus induced 
heavenly things cannot be readily discerned. Taken from Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 48. Now, the, the whole thing, remember, we talked about the preparation of food as being essential. Say, for example, if you did not prepare your grains properly, it can cause mineral deficiencies such as iron, calcium, magnesium, copper. If you're deficient in those nutrients, then you know, it takes a toll on the body and it can lend itself to disease. If you're deficient in iron, you can have anemia that can affect your body in different ways. And so um, the preparation of the food is important and uh, getting the right kinds of food is also important. Question five. The digestion, digestive tract, also known as the gastrointestinal tract or GI tract, starts at the mouth continues to the esophagus, uh, which is that long pipe-like structure. Uh, it goes to the stomach, uh, then to the small intestine, large intestines commonly referred to as the colon, and the rectum. It ends at the anus, and that's your whole digestive tract. The entire system from the mouth to the anus is how long? It is about 30 feet long. That is lengthy, but it wraps around there in our body, and the food has to travel all through this way. That's why it is important that you have the right kind of food that would push in and sweep that food all the way down. If it is that your food does not have sufficient fiber, it can take longer for that food to make its way all the way to be excreted out of the body. Now, the intestinal lining can re be replaced approximately every six to ten days. The sight, smell, and taste of food trigger the process of digestion so that the stomach is prepared when the food arrives. So the cells along the lining of your intestinal um, and this whole GI tract, it changes regularly, and that's why it is easy for one to be healed when, with anything that goes wrong with that lining because the cells there changes rapidly. And also note that from the time you smell food, that can trigger hormones within the body to make you feel hungry, to make you want to eat. And also it can trigger uh, salivary enzymes and other aspects um, of digestion to digest food that you could give to the body. So it's very, um, you know, I've seen it where, you know, it's not yet lunch time and someone shows up in the room with food that has a high, strong aroma and it smells good, um, you know, whether the food be healthy or not. But I've seen where it has actually triggered hormones um, in the body to cause me to feel hungry and I'm like oh no you know so um, these aspects the, the sight smell taste can actually trigger that so we need to um, be careful and uh, be strong on that point now digestion question six digestion um, begins with chewing and this is quite an important aspect the, the, this practical aspect of digestion chewing uh, the five digestive fluids. It starts saliva, gastric juice, bile, pancreatic juice, and intestinal juice to flow. So from the time you begin to chew, these different aspects of digestion start, um, is triggered and prepares the body for digestion. That's why it is so important for us to have food, solid food, so that we can chew. Uh, the liquids will not do this effectively. And so you're told if you're drinking liquids, like a smoothie or so, chew it, chew that liquid. And, uh, um, and so you, you want to chew that liquid, move it around in your mouth so that you would 
uh, cause those enzymes to be released uh, and uh, help you with digestion of that particular thing. So you want uh, the liquids that move up our mouth a bit, mull it around in your mouth, and, um, and then the solid food, you want to break that down like into a juice. So your teeth is quite important. It is essential to have a healthy set of teeth. Um, if you're missing teeth, you are compromised with your digestion. You're using your tongue more to try to squash that food. But it's quite important for you to have a healthy set of teeth. The saliva softens the food and transforms some of the starch into sugar. The longer the food is chewed, the more completely the starch is digested and the larger the amount of gastric juice produced in the stomach in readiness to digest the food when it arrives. The peristaltic waves which move the food along the digestive tract also begin to move. Proper chewing and tasting of the food permits the nerves of taste to judge the quality of the food and to regulate the intake to suit the needs of the body. So your food should look good, taste good, you know, and, uh, and so that helps you to eat up enough of what you put before you. So proper chewing also helps to preserve the teeth by giving them the exercise they need. And so your teeth is one way in which it's exercised by chewing. So the drier the food is, uh, you would be caused to chew more. And, um, and so that's quite helpful for digestion as well as to ensure that your teeth is kept strong and healthy. So the mouth is essential in digestion. And you have all these ducts and glands here that produces different forms of enzymes in order to help with the digestion of the food. The three physiological divisions of the stomach now. So as the food leaves the mouth, it comes down this pipe-like structure called the esophagus. And uh, so it you know, the movements in the body that helps to push that food down along. But the food comes down and uh, it, it, it gets to the upper portion of the stomach. Um, you have what you call here the cardiac valve or the esophagus splinter, which closes off. And food is like in the upper portion of the stomach, and it has to move all the way down through the stomach. In this upper portion here, you have where the actual food enzymes work on breaking down the food. Uh, so like your plant um, raw foods that you eat, uh, like lettuce, your cucumbers, your raw tomatoes, uh, your raw banana, the fruits that you eat, it, digestion takes place in the upper portion. It begins a lot of the digestion of those raw foods begin digestion in this upper portion of the stomach. So why? And you see why in a little bit. Um, because there's all this different food, but the raw, it takes place digestion, it, it begins to break down in this upper portion using the enzymes that is within that raw food itself that would help to break down the, the food. You know, for example, if you um, had an apple and uh, you cut through the apple, say the apple falls, it hits. When that apple hits the ground or some solid surface is squeezed, the, the cells within the apple itself, it's broken. And uh, what, once it's broken, it begins to digest itself. As a matter of fact, from the time you pick a fruit, the enzymes within it, within those cells, begin to uh, 
sort of break down the fruit itself, and that helps in the ripening process of the fruit and, and the live food. And, um, and so when you see like a brown spot on an apple or brown spot on a fruit banana, it's because the enzymes within that area, it's beginning to digest the, the food itself. It's breaking it down. And as the cells are broken, you have the discoloration taking place. And, um, and so when we eat that and chew it, those enzymes within the food, the raw food itself, is going into the body. And so from that, it, it has the necessary enzymes for that particular food to help it to be broken down. And so that takes place in the upper portion of the stomach. Now you go to the middle portion of the stomach, and, and there's a timing for that to happen. Um, it begins when you stop chewing, that this all starts off. And when you start chewing from then, for the next 45 minutes to 60 minutes, you find that the body is now, through the nerves, in recognition of what is here within the food, it begins to release through the blood certain uh, chemicals that is required to make hydrochloric acid. So uh, the, like the, um, different, the different chemicals comes in here, and once it interacts with pepsin within the stomach, it creates hydrochloric acid, which is required now for digesting protein. So protein would not be ready to be digested until the first 45 minutes to an hour, then protein begins to be digested because now you have hydrochloric acid being made here in the stomach uh, in order to break down protein. The stomach then would be so acidic in order to break down the protein. Hence the reason you don't go drinking soon after eating your meal or to even eat closer, you, you stop eating, and then you say, oh, I remember something, and you go back to take something to eat, the process of digestion begins all over again. So there is, digestion takes time, and uh, we need to recognize this and uh, give it the time it needs. Now, when protein begins digestion, say the next 45 minutes to an hour, it starts digesting here within the middle portion. Uh, after that it's done, it, the material from, that's broken down moves along again. It moves along again uh, to the lower part of the stomach um, where the, that liquid that moves along, it's called chyme. Chyme now accumulates here in the lower portion of the stomach, and then it drips, like spoonfuls at a time, drips through the um, pyloric, pyloric valve, or what you call a duodenum splinter at this point. It drips into the duodenum, which is this portion here, for further digestion of your carbohydrates at this time and your sugars, the glucose that's coming down through with your food and the fats. So the, understand too that chyme enters into the duodenum, dripping into the duodenum, spoonfuls at a time. It doesn't just push on along and hence the process of digestion of your meal takes time. And so that's why we would say to folks, you drink your water after your meal, two hours after your meal, clearing the stomach by that time and having the food moved on along further because any sooner it's going to dilute the gastric juices. Now, the question seven, the benefit derived from food does not depend so much on the quality eaten as on its sour digestion, nor the gratification of taste, so much on the amount of food swallowed as on the length of time it remains in the mouth. So your teeth 
helps with breaking down that food. The chemical reaction is real and quite important, but the more you chew your food, you eat in the proper digestion of your food, and the stomach and, and the um, different enzymes would be able to work with that quite easily without putting extra burden on the body. Have you ever eaten, um, say like corn for example, and see whole corn come out in the back way? In your stool? Why? There's no teeth in your stomach. It's more chemical reactions going on once it passes your teeth, and so they, it can't, the body cannot handle it. So you require your teeth to break down this large piece of corn, one grain of corn, one grain of pumpkin seeds and flower seeds. You take your teeth and you break that down. So people who have poor dental structures, you would find you need to mash your food some bit, uh, blend your food, um, you know, make it a little pulpy, but break it down. And um, before you eat it, because uh, that single grain of corn that passes throughout in your stool, understand that you did not get the nutrients from it because it was never broken. And that's why even like the flax seed and chia seed, they need to be broken in order for you to get the nutrients. Flax seed is so small and a bit tough that if it missed your teeth, you go on having it, you, it's going to just pass through hole in your body and you will not get the nutrient that it has to offer. So you need to eat, chew your food properly. And so chewing, take your time in chewing. Don't cut and swallow. Chew, break it down. So after the food is broken down, your tongue pushes the food into the back of your stump, mouth where it goes to the esophagus. And this muscular tube that is connected to the stomach helps food travel down to the stomach. Now have a look at this little animation here that shows how the food is moved along nicely. Look at the peristaltic waves waving the food all through, pushing it along all through the colon. And uh, look at the food there, you see? So it's moving that food along and it takes a time to do that. And all through the way of the colon to help it um, to be eliminated through the body. So in all those little movements takes place without us doing it. it automatic that it happens. So carbohydrates and fats begin digestion in the mouth with your salivary enzymes that come forth there, um, like lipase and so forth, all those others in the mouth for breaking down the fats, proteins, um, carbohydrates, starches, um, the sugars. It begins in their mouth, uh, pauses a while in the stomach and continues in the small intestine. So carbohydrate digestion in the mouth you have chewing is important to expose surface areas for enzymatic action. So the more you chew the carbs that your ground provision, your rice, your grains, you, and the more you chew them, you spread them out along. And so the enzymes can recognize it and work with it. And so the digestion begins in the mouth. Amylase, which is an um, enzyme is secreted by the paratoids to initiate complex carbohydrate digestion. Then in your stomach you have salivary enzymes coming plus any supplemental plant enzymes that say the raw foods that you have eaten um, or for individuals who may have taken as a supplement digestive enzyme will have the required enzymes for a wide range of foods to enable the body to break that down. And so your digestive enzymes should actually be taken before you eat so that it's in the body already to help you with digesting your meal. So the enzymes continue to hydrolyze 
carbohydrates um, for 30 to 60 minutes until hydrochloric acid comes in um, to the stomach now and where you get the pH of the stomach being lowered and so the carbohydrate digestion pauses, allows protein to be digested and then when it moves on along into the deodandum carbohydrate begin di um, continued digestion again. So in the deodandum the, you have the pancreatin enzyme coming from the pancreas now recognizes how many, there's an, a hormone that sits within the duodenum that runs to the pancreas and to your liver to tell those organs how much carbohydrates, how much fats and protein that enters into the duodenum and the pancreas now and your liver will produce adequate amounts of enzymes to match what is within the duodenum to help with the digestion there. So a pancreatin enzyme completes breakdown of carbohydrates. This is your sugar into maltose, lactose, or sucrose, depending on what you had to eat. If you had, if it's grains, that's the form of carbohydrates there within the duodenum, or it, um, or if it is lactose, they would, uh, it would produce if it. Um, if you had dairy or if you had white sugar or white flour, it will produce what it needs to. And uh, then um, it, many complex carbohydrates such as raffinose, which comes from your coarse vegetables, peas, beans, for example, soy, uh, and saccharose, which your body cannot digest, um, you know, those, the, the body recognizes this and um, so all that is within the duodenum and so that if it is the difficulty in digesting um, the, these coarse vegetables, the peas and beans and so forth, it results in gas formation within the, the, the small intestine. So the body doesn't have the enzymes for breaking um, these down efficiently. Therefore, it is important for us to do what? Look at the meal preparation. So how do you prepare your coarse vegetables? We spoke about adding the heat that breaks down the strong cellulose fiber in the coarse vegetables in order to make the, the food readily available and, and, and bioavailable to the body to get the nutrients from those foods. So if you do eat these foods raw, they're going through the body and you don't have cellulase, um, the enzyme, to help um, in adequate amount to help to break it down. And, um, and, and so you get a lot of issues. Okay, so let us um, make sure that preparation of the food is important. When it comes to the coarse vegetables, your peas and your beans, it's cooked long and uh, so it aids with digestion. Now looking at proteins, again, chewing is important. And in the mouth, you have lipase that is secreted by the submandibular glands. And so that aids with uh, a little bit beginning protein in there, but not in significant amount. Um, it just interacts with the protein. And so in the stomach is where protein actually gets broken down. So you have the salivary enzymes, again, from the lipase, added with supplemental plant enzymes um, that would so from the plant foods that you eat, and you see why it is important for us at every meal to have some raw food. And, and if you look at the chart for what we've laid out um, to, to, to say, okay, this is how you eat for your breakfast and your lunch and your supper, raw food appears in all of them. And you eat your raw food first because it is important for digestion of the whole meal. 
and um, and so the the enzymes coming from your saliva as well as the enzymes coming from that raw foods that you ate at the start of your meal it makes it now with um, it, it comes now to help with digestion of your food so not until um, you know up to 60 minutes later can you find hydrochloric acid within the stomach and it um, and so hydrochloric acid it, again the blood produces uh, I think it's like nitrogen the blood produces what it needs for hydrochloric acid to be made in the stomach hydrochloric is not made outside and brought to the stomach it is made within the stomach and what you know what is important in, in producing this too so that's why you keep hydrated uh, you, you drink in between your meals so you help the body so there's water available it mixes um, here and and so you find um, hydrochloric acid produced in the stomach it causes the pH of the stomach um, that that you now to be more acidic so that acid alkaline balance in the stomach it's acidic in order to digest protein so it drops anywhere below, below three closer to two and um, and so you know for your your plant-based protein to be digested the stomach needs to be acidic anywhere from 1.35 to, to 3.35 and uh, if you eat um, animal-based protein, it needs to be really low, like 1.35 um, of, of acidity in order to digest that animal-based protein. So um, the, in the stomach, you need more acidity within there. Um, the geodenum, um, you find that pancreatic enzymes would recognize it, um, if there's any protein that's coming down to the diandenum and help with the digestive process. Um, and then that whatever um, nutrients comes from the food, it passes on through the portal vein up to the liver, and uh, there you get, say, like amino acids that goes to the liver and any other nutrients that um, is needed by the body goes to the liver for inspection it gets into the bloodstream it gets out into the different parts of the body and lastly you have the lipid digestion um, again lipase being um, too is important lipase being produced in the mouth in the stomach you do have where the fat is paused with digestion um, in the stomach but the digestion of fats is taken up again within the diadenum. Notice that the liver will produce bile when it recognizes fat within the diadenum. The liver will produce bile, and bile at salt helps to emulsify or to break down fat. So it, exposed, so it breaks down the fat, exposing the fat bonds um, to be broken down by pancreatic lipase. And, uh, and so bile acts like, say, if your hand um, had grease on it, how do you get rid of that? Simply putting it under the water uh, will not help to cleanse your hand and free of grease. You do need uh, soap. So bile acts like soap um, mixed with the water to help get rid of that grease on your hand. So bile actually recognizes the fat, uh, breaks it down, Right, it's how pancreatic enzymes now comes to help break that down, and so you get the omega-3 from your fats. Um, so the supplemental lipase um, will be activated. So any supplements that you may have taken um, will be activated here within the duodenum. And so fatty acids are released to be absorbed through the intestinal wall. So you see fats take place down. And that's why we, in our chart of, um, uh, of how you eat your, your meal, you see fats at the end. Because fats really, the, the digestion of fats takes place last. So that you have the raw foods first, then the rest of your meal, and fats at the end to be digested last in the whole process of, in the last stage of digestion. So the stomach. 
The average human ad adult stomach holds about 8.5 cups of food. So it can, stomach can stretch and take a lot of, um, of food that we can put into there. Uh, gastric juice is composed mainly of pepsin, an enzyme that breaks down proteins and hydrochloric acid. It also contains sodium chloride and potassium. So you see how nicely your pink Himalayan sea salt fits into hair by providing sodium chloride, potassium, other minerals. But um, gastric juice is composed of pepsin, hydrochloric acid, sodium chloride, potassium. That mix of the gastric juice um, within the stomach for digesting protein. You need those elements. Um, hence, too, you see sometimes individuals have low stomach acid, and so we'd recommend like b in HCL, uh, which helps to improve the stomach acid within the stomach to aid with digestion of your meal. So if you're short of that, we see when you are low on stomach acid, we see shortly what are the effects on the body. But hydrochloric acid triggers the release of pepsin, which also kills bacteria that you may get from the food you eat. So if you're in your meal, came with some bacteria, by having adequate amounts of hydrochloric acid um, and pepsin, it helps to break down um, that bacteria and to eliminate it. So gastric acid has a pH between 1.35 to 3.5, but usually closer to 2. Gastric acid kills most of the bacteria that enter with food. Mucus is produced by cells in the stomach to protect the stomach from the corrosive effect of hydrochloric acid. Remember, hydrochloric acid is made in the stomach. And so on the lining, the walls of your stomach, you have a layer of, of um, mucus that protects the stomach itself, the stomach wall, from uh, the hydrochloric acid reaching to it and, and injuring it. So look at this. If you do not have enough mucus that is produced, it causes the walls of the stomach to burn. And uh, you know, so it's important for you to have adequate mucus. Again, drinking your water in between your meals, keeping hydrated is important in all of this. And, and, and so if you did not drink adequate of, of water in between your meals, you can eat your food and come away with the burning a bit in your stomach because you don't have liquids through the system to pull. So um, what now, if you don't produce adequate hydrochloric acid, um, what happens to your stomach? You have low stomach acid. Low stomach acid is where there is inadequate acid in the stomach to digest food. So trouble. Don't have enough acid within your stomach to digest protein. What's going to happen here? So what can cause low stomach acid? And so these are the causes. So recognize these are the things that you do or not do to, that would trigger low stomach acid. You need to be dependent on the body to produce adequate amounts of stomach acid, not dependent on a supplement. You use supplements to help you bounce your way back up, but soon enough you're not supposed to be using the betaine HCL entirely for the rest of your life. Um, unless there was some, you know, injury, physical injury that, that cut through your stomach or, or some system in the body to prevent you from making your own stomach acid. But the simple things that we do. So here you have, say, for example, drinking water too close to a meal. So how close to a meal should you stop drinking water? 15 to 30 minutes. If you know that you have stomach issues, give yourself a longer time. 30 minutes before your meal time, you stop drinking water. And eating and drinking now with diluted gastric juice, lowering your stomach acid. What about using baking powder, baking soda, alkaline water? 
these things lower stomach acid within the, the stomach, the hydrochloric and the gastric juice within the stomach because they are alkaline in nature. They're not acidic. Ingesting this within your meal or close to meal time will cause you to have low stomach acid. Aging. When you get over 40, your, the amount of um, stomach acid you use, you, you may can be lowered. Again, the significant importance of doing things right um, to make sure we have healthy digestion, exercising and, and um, you know, having regularity in our meal times and so forth um, is quite important once you get past 40. And that's why a lot of the elderly people have issues. But again, if it, once you um, regulate and do things proper, then you, your problem with this would be drastically reduced. Um, then you have adrenal fatigue, alcohol consumption, bacterial infection um, can cause low stomach acid, uh, and uh, chronic stress. So that's why you're told not to eat on the go or eat when you're stressful. Um, medication side effects can cause you to have low stomach acid. So the consequence of having low stomach acid, question nine, is that proteins cannot be properly broken down into amino acids. The food sits too long in the stomach and it putrefies instead of being properly digested. You can have bad breath. So you can also have lack of nutrients, um, which would be, which can cause depression, hair loss, brittle nails, anemia, B12, and iron deficiency. So if, if stomach acid is too low, these are some of the things um, that can happen. You get bloating and gas coming. Um, you have an imbalanced gut flora. You have pathogenic and foodborne bacteria increase because you have low stomach. The, the, um, usually these bacteria would be killed by um, having a low stomach pH, meaning that your stomach is not so acidic to help kill off these bacteria, but with low stomach acid you don't have that that can take place. And so all these foodborne bacteria enters within your intestines and you have in, an overgrowth of the pathogenic or bad bacteria within your intestines causing you to have issues. Leaky gut, um, therefore, will be created and um, you can have food allergies coming from this because now larger molecules of food get leaked out into your bloodstream and the body starts to react once that enters there. Um, so examples of diseases that can be caused by imbalanced gut flora will be the allergies, acne, arthritis, headache, autoimmune diseases, uh, depression, and attention deficit disorder. So it affects the body if digestion goes wrong. More consequence of low stomach acid, you have digestive infections such as H. pylori, a bacteria that causes some ulcers. You have constipation, bloating, gas, belching. With inadequate food acid, the food sits in the stomach, it decays, it putrefies, and so you get the gas, the bloating, the belching. The, stomach, the low stomach acid leads to heartburn and acid reflux. And your risk for low stomach acid is higher if you do not have enough beneficial bacteria in the intestinal tract. You consume a lot of antacids and if you're over 45 years. The stomach uh, becomes, it, it, the stomach makes it more hospitable to bad bacteria overgrowth and bile is also, this is very important, that bile is not produced for digesting fat in the small intestines when you have low stomach acid because the amount of acidity um, that, that uh, is within the stomach triggers 
uh, the production of bile. So not only um, the fat trigger production of bile, but how um, acidic is your, um, the acidity within your stomach, it triggers also production of bile, which is important for breaking down your fat. And so you find that individuals who may have these fats, you may be eating the nuts and so forth, but you're not digesting it well because of poor bile production. You see it's a whole range of things. And so that's why we're working with individuals who tell you, okay, let's take the probiotic, improve the gut flora. Um, let's take digestive enzymes at the same time. It's all the entire tract that needs to be aided. And then let's take the BT and HCL, recognizing that if you don't have adequate amounts of hydrochloric acid in hair, good amounts of stomach acid, that it can affect the entire digestion of your meals. And so it's not like you take probiotics by itself. You're going to take the, the digestive enzyme and the hydrochloric acid. It helps in the proper digestion. So when the contents of the stomach are not acidic enough, a little valve called the pylorus does not open up. And uh, so um, the contents of the stomach do not pass from the stomach into the intestine. So it's a protective way um, for food to get into your, your intestine. So only when the stomach is acidic enough will the um, pylorus, which is this um, pyloric splinter right here, um, will it open up for the food to go on. So you do want to have um, this proper digestion. So don't be drinking with your meal to, di um, to dilute the gastric juices. Don't be drinking too close to your meal to digest, dilute the gastric juice because it's not going to be acidic enough to eat with the food moving on. And so you'd find that food remain and it feels, folks would say, oh, that's the meal. It just caused the food to rest on my stomach. Why? Because it's taking longer than it should. So the stomach needs to get rid of the contents within the stomach here. And if it's not acidic enough for the pyloric splinter to open up, for the food to pass on along, what do you think happens? It's going to look to pass on through some other way because it can't stay in the stomach forever. So it then goes back up to the esophagus. And so you find that you could, um, this esophagus splinter right here gets attacked with, with stomach hitting it, um, acid hitting it. It opens up. You find your throat burning you now and your esophagus along that line burning you because the the acid is coming back up. And you call that heartburn and you feel it all in your throat. So it's quite important for us to understand this whole process. Question 10. Very little absorption takes place in the stomach and gastric digestion changes the food and prepare, prepares it for the action of the digestive fluid of the small intestine where it is absorbed. The stomach takes in the food, then churns it and breaks it down into tiny particles called chyme. This is done to mix the gastric juice with the food. And understand, I tell folks, you draw some blood from your body and you don't see any chunks of, in your blood. So anything that passes through the body um, you know, it needs to be broken down into this liquid form. So these tiny particles are broken down into chyme, uh, and that mixes with the gastric juice in the stomach. Question 12. After an hour or two, the chyme is then released into small batches, like tablespoonful, into the small intestine. So they drip into the small intestine. And this continues for about four hours until the stomach is empty quite important. It takes like about four to four and a half hours for that stomach to be empty. If you eat sooner than that, you're going to cause food to remain within your stomach too long and you can get heartburn and a host of effects. 
I'd just like to share with you um, a little story here. Um, in, on June 6, 1822, so centuries ago, um, we, there was a doctor by the name of William Beaumont, and he was known to be like the pioneer or the father of gastric physiology. And on why, what was significant about Beaumont's work? He had this gentleman called Alexis St. Martin. And Alexis um, St. Martin, he actually worked um, in America at an American fur factory. Um, on, and so in, in Mackinac Island. And on this particular day, June 6, he had an, an accident where a shotgun was close to him and shot him accidentally at close range in his stomach. So they said, you know, whatever he had for the morning breakfast gushed out as the, the bullet wound um, took place, that hole was made. And so Beaumont um, was brought to uh, Alexis St. Martin to treat him. And so, you know, they, they took out... Um, the bullet, they dealt with him, treated him, and, and laid him down calmly and thought he would die. But St. Martin did not die. Um, in fact, what happened is that the wound started to heal up nicely, and it closed in somewhat. But amazingly, that hole never closed entirely. So here he continued to live with this fissure, or like a hole in his stomach, and that you can see from the external bit, a hole going all the way through his stomach. It just did not close up. And so Dr. Berman now had an idea. This man, St. Martin, could no longer work. And he said, St. Martin, come be my handyman. And at the same time, I'd help you. And he would work with St. Martin. And he recognized, um, you know, what was happening and he actually ran lots of experiments on St. Martin. So what he um, actually did was um, that he took pieces of food, tied it to a string, and lowered it through that hole in the stomach of St. Martin and observed every few hours. He would pull the string out and observe how the piece of food would be broken down. And uh, soon he recognized that, you know, what was in the stomach, that gastric juice and so forth, was in the stomach. That juice actually eroded and broke down these pieces of food at different rates, different kinds of food. And um, he actually at one point drew out some stomach acid from St. Martin, placed them into cups and placed food pieces into those cups and observed and took time um, record of the breakdown of the food bits and um, and so recognize the importance of this chemical reaction in the digestion of food. So these guys played a, a huge role in um, in teaching us how you know foods are digested um, and and it helped um, you know be the base for a lot of research and further study. So many make a mistake in drinking cold water with their meals. So we're talking about not lowering your stomach acid and recognizing the importance of having, um, you know, good amount of, uh, of chemical within the stomach. So they make a mistake of even drinking cold water with their meals. Food should not be washed down and in the first place when you're eating and then taken with meals water diminishes the flow of saliva. So even the first bit of getting those saliva enzymes is not um, in adequate amount. And then if you use cold water, cold juice, the colder the, lo the water, the greater the injury to the stomach. Ice water or ice lemonade taken with meals will arrest digestion until the system has imparted sufficient warmth to the stomach to enable it to take up its work again. Slowly masticulate the food and allow the saliva to mingle with the food. So chewing being important, and again, don't add these water or juices to the, to the meal 
that would slow down digestion. So question 13, what can delay the stomach from emptying in four hours? Um, if you eat in between your meals, you cause the digestion of that meal um, to begin all over again. From the time you start chewing, digestion stops, something is happening here, oh, more food is coming, it waits, and then when you stop chewing, then the process of digestion begins all over again. So and that can cause food to remain in your stomach longer than four, four and a half hours. If you eat, therefore, if you eat your meals too close to each other, not giving that spacing of at least five hours apart, you can delay digestion of your meal in your stomach. Overeating, too much of food, irregularity, because the body loving routine recognizes, okay, times for eating. Once you have regularity, the body begins to produce uh, the, the signal hormones and, and um, signals to your brain, hungry, time to eat and begin, you know, producing the different um, juices. And drinking and eating with delayed digestion. You know, First Corinthians 14, 33 tells us that God is an author, is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. And verse 40 of Corinthians 14 tells us that all things be done decently and in order. And Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And for this, we need to be able to recognize um, there is a time for everything. So even a time for eating and a way in which to do it. So do you want to strengthen your mind is the question. The mind does not wear out or break down so often on account of diligent employment and hard study as on the account of eating improper food at improper times and of careless in attention to the laws of health. Diligent study is not the principal cause of the breaking down of the mental powers. What is it? The main cause is improper diet, irregular meals, and a lack of physical exercise. Irregular hours for eating and sleeping suck the brain forces. So a lot of times folks think, well, they're studying and how, you know, their mind is affected, they can't retain well, and they're not, um, you know, they go into a mental breakdown. It's not too much study, but the intemperance that goes along with it, that would cause the mind to break down. So after food sits in the stomach, now kind moves on to the small intestine and as food travels to the small intestine you have the liver and the pancreas that break down the chyme with the enzyme they have made. So the liver and the pancreas have their role. The liver makes an enzyme called bile. Bile is used to break down and the pancreas makes enzymes that break down starches, proteins, and fats. So your liver is high up here. It produces bile. So these green little dots of bile coming into your gallbladder, which holds and retains bile for when you need to use. Now, when there is, the food enters into the duodenum area, which is this little portion here, you see the bile now will be released from your gallbladder, coming all the way down through this tube, this fat, helping to digest and to break down this fat. The pancreas, this organ here on the other hand, helps also in producing pancreatic enzymes to break down the fat, to break down also carbohydrates and any um, protein that's now coming down into this area. It helps with that. And again, remember, it depends on the amount that's within here, which would cause the gallbladder, the liver, the pancreas to produce what is needed in order to break down what is within here. So the content of your food is quite important on how you overwork these organs.
And if you did not chew your food up in your mouth properly, it overworks your liver, it overworks your pancreas because they now have to take up this plaque. Now let's have a look at the amazing organ, the greatest worker in the body, the liver. So the liver is an organ that is located in the upper right hand side of the abdomen. It is mostly behind the rib cage, and the liver of an adult normally weighs close to three pounds. The liver is such an important organ that we can survive only one or two days if it shuts down. And if the liver fails, your body will fail too. The liver is important. The liver is the only internal organ that can regenerate. So you know if you cut your hand off, it does not grow back. Your liver if you cut a piece of it, your liver can function even when up to 75% of it is diseased and removed by surgery. You take off a whole portion of it. What do you think will happen? It will regenerate. It will make new cells and rebuild and build back a liver for you. So it's, it's so important to the body that it will rebuild. Um, but at the same time, we need to maintain keeping our liver healthy. So your, our poor liver can take a lot of damage before it starts complaining, and we don't notice until it is severely hurt, because there's some people where you find that this liver can be severely hurt, and it hardens, and uh, once that takes place, you know, it's trouble. It, it can cause them to die. So question 14, what are three functions of the liver? At least, you know, list some. So after the food has broken down in the small intestine, most of it is carried to the liver where the process of digestion is completed. The liver take, breaks down nutrients now from the food. So it kind of gets into the duodenum, the, the, then it passes on to your small intestines, it goes up through the portal vein to the liver, and in the liver it says, okay, distributing the different nutrients around in the body. So um, the liver breaks down nutrients from the food to produce energy when needed and stores vitamins, minerals, and glucose, the sugars. The liver also acts like an inspector to examine the food and remove hurtful material that may be in it, like alcohol, like pepper, and other irritating substances now will be removed by the liver. Because if it, it continues on in your blood, it's going to affect your body in some form. And so people with poor liver function can get some of these things out into their blood still um, because of the liver not functioning properly and doing its work. So the liver really have a lot of work to do. So wouldn't it be great that we don't create alcohol-like situations with fermentation in the body? Um, will, will it not be great that we abstain from alcohol altogether and then you have less work for your liver to do? Wouldn't it be great if we abstain from the pepper, ingesting the pep high sources, um, hot peppers, chili peppers, the cayenne pepper, wouldn't it be great if we were not using those? Then you don't put that extra burden on your liver or other irritating substances like the caffeine and so forth. Then you put all this work on your liver. You know, let's be kind to our body. You know, the only person, only one in the world that can be kind to you and take care of you is you. As long as in your, you're in your right mind and you have control over your choices, um, it's you. So you have the power to decide what you put within your body and how you can cause it you know, you know, to be well or not well. So you be kind to yourself, kind to your organs, be kind and caring to your liver and take care of it because it has to take care of you and your well-being.
So another function of the liver is that it clears the blood of waste products. When you take the drug medication or other poisonous substances, it helps to clear that from the blood. And then it controls the production. And so it, the, the liver is so powerful that it breaks down these toxins that comes to the body or these um, poisonous elements that comes to it. Um, it breaks it down in a way that it would not be harmful to the rest of the body um, and sends it out through your blood to your kidneys to be excreted, um, you know, or as the case may be. So um, it, it can take quite a, a, a hard hit. And then you want to, also, the liver also controls the production and the removal of cholesterol. So it produces cholesterol as well as help to remove cholesterol from your blood. And um, then it helps the excess cholesterol from your blood. And then it helps to regulate hormones. Uh, so the liver has quite a lot to do and, and hundreds of other functions, um, like about 500 different functions the liver does. So the liver produces many important um, substances, especially proteins that are necessary for good health. Um, for example, it produces proteins like albumin, uh, a protein that, is ca that carries other molecules through the bloodstream, as well as proteins that cause the blood to clot properly. You know, so different um, things the liver would do here. The liver helps to purify the blood by changing potentially harmful chemicals into harmless ones. The sources of these chemicals can be outside the body, um, for example, medication or alcohol you ingested, um, or chemicals that can be produced in the body, for example, ammonia, which is produced from breaking up of proteins, or bilirubin, which is produced from breaking up of hemoglobin within the blood. Um, these, you know, the body has no use for it afterwards, so the liver would help in breaking that down. Um, and so the liver removes chemicals from the blood, usually changing them into harmless chemicals. And, uh, when, and then either secrete them through the bile for elimination in the stool or secrete them back into the blood when they would be removed by the kidneys and eliminated in the urine. So see how marvelous the body is made? You know, it, everything has a, a way that the Lord has created us, even when the abuses come, to find some way to work with it. But the problem comes that when we're hitting the body with all of this, um, you know, chemicals that toxic and so forth, you're causing the liver to overwork and you can cause it to break down over time. Now, we live in a society that is literally full of toxins, and everywhere you look, it is becoming more and more difficult for your liver to keep up with the growing number of toxins you encounter on a daily basis. So you have toxic chemicals that's in your meat or non-organic food, soap, shampoo, conditioners, toothpaste, deodorants, personal hygiene products, that you, whatever you put on your skin will be absorbed into your bloodstream. And say what? It goes to your liver to help break down that toxic cream and lotion and so forth that you put on your skin. Makeup, you know, that you put on your face. Um, the the clean, cleaning products that you inhale or that your hands touch. Carpets within the home can produce certain chemicals. Um, in your car, the plastics and so forth in your car. That's why when you go into your car and it's hot, um, you turn the glass down low, so let the breeze uh, pass through and get some of that toxic air out of the car. Um, water, you want to have clean water, um, not anything that's contaminated. Plastics that, um, you know, with, if, when it's heated, leaches out into your liquids, into your water, and the list goes on. So many toxic chemicals in and around our environment. Your liver must get rid of these toxins through bile and to help, and with the help of your gallbladder, if overloaded, your liver has a harder time getting these toxins out through your bile to be excreted 
ultimately some of the toxins will be stored in the fat cells in your liver. So what happens if these toxic chemicals cannot get out through your blood and there's no avenue, you know, it's not, you're not eating and so forth depending on your diet to empty that gallbladder to be refilled, um, you know, if it's not getting out to move through there, what is the liver going to do? Okay, let's park aside in my fat cells. And so you find that the toxins do not get released in bile, may be equally or more toxic than the original toxins from the beginning um, from your liver and causing inflammation in your bile ducts, now slowing down bile flow. And so this slowing down creates a vicious cycle of more intracellular toxins and you can now have what you call the gallbladder um, di disease and so forth because of the inflammation that's along the bile duct, the bile cannot flow out through your gallbladder. It's backed up, stored up too much, and you have um, gallstones that begin forming, and now you have a whole lot of, you know, issues. So again, it's so important um, to deal with the whole broad spectrum of keeping the body healthy. So um, give two factors that can hurt your liver. Got poor digested food. Chew your food properly. Too much sugar. High fructose corn syrup is hidden in a lot of foods. Maltose, dextrose, um, dextrose and so forth. A lot of foods have hidden sugars within it. If you were to go on the internet and search up um, different forms of sugars, you see a whole huge range of different names that is hidden within these processed foods. And you may not recognize them to be sugar, but they, they are. And so processed foods can hurt our liver. Heavy metals like mercury, PCBs, and lead. Uh, and lead, you know, so even the fish that has mercury or um, heavy metals within them that you would eat, those things can hurt your liver. So you have liver issues. Don't say, well, I'm not eating chicken and the red meat, but I'm eating fish. It's not going to help you here. An abundance of bad bacteria in your stomach can damage your stomach lining and allow bacterial toxins to permeate your gut wall and so you find that you you have leaky gut now, and so large molecules of toxins, um, proteins, um, and, and you know any medication that you're taking get leaked out into your bloodstream, heading for your liver to deal with. Um, you know these can contribute to toxic liver and can put you at risk for a condition called NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Disease caused by an inherited genetic disorder um, or response to infection with virus. Or your liver can, um, you know, it's been hurt in another way when you have disease resulting from an autoimmune attack. So three signs of an unhealthy liver. Um, now you know the common thing about jaundice, your eyes being yellow or your skin getting yellow, unhealthy liver. You can have chronic fatigue, acne, sinus problems, um, allergies, mood swings, migraine, low vitamin D level because your liver is important in the process of making vitamin D. And so when you start having these issues, it's important for you to cleanse your liver to help to restore it to good health and to be able to function well. So when we talk about cleansing your liver, it's to help to remove these toxins from the body. And so you have here, this is an image of a nice, healthy liver. And here you have where it's um, a marginal fatty liver disease that's taking place here. I mean, look at this. The fatty, the fat cells that now has um, stored all these toxins and other stuff that you've been doing to hurt it, your liver will be malfunctioning in this state. The normal liver is shiny and regular in shape. It's soft to the touch. In contrast with this liver, um, it's 
tough, it's fatty, it's discolored, and you carry on like this, you're going to shut down and you're going to have problems. So you have the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So people would say, but I don't drink alcohol, so why do I have this um, fatty liver? It's because you do have a condition where you're non-alcoholic. So all the things that hurt your liver and so forth um, causes it to be in this state. And so people, they don't, you know, the people with NAFLT have a higher chance of developing type 2 diabetes, heart attack, stroke, because of the cholesterol impact, you know, and it, what kinds of enzymes is not produced within the blood um, to cause the proper functioning of these other organs and parts of the body. And your liver, other liver disorders are quite common and can worsen. So it is important, that's why when we're helping folks with even cholesterol to reduce their high cholesterol levels, um, to regulate the blood pressure, to regulate their sugar levels, and to reverse um, the diabetes type 2 and so forth, we always go back to cleansing your blood, cleansing your liver. Those are important factors in terms of helping the body to be restored because the liver has a huge role in this and many other areas of disease and disease reversal. So um, a simple fatty liver will have excess fat buildup in the liver cells and non-alcoholic um, septohepatitis, which is inflammation now, is where you have excess fat in the liver cells that causes inflammation. So these hepatitic cells within your liver can become inflamed. Then you have another stage where you have fibrosis, um, which is the scar tissue that forms within the liver. And uh, then you, and these can all be worked back to restore them. When you get to the stage of cirrhosis of the liver, it's a serious condition where normal liver tissue is replaced by a lot of fibrosis, the scarred tissue. And uh, so the structure and function of the liver is now disrupted. And this can lead to liver failure. So, um, you know, the, that tissue is not so hardened and uh, you know that's why if you have little liver effects be aggressive with your um, the protocols that's being shared with you because recognize it can go through different stages of elevation and where it's caught in such a state let it not be too late for you to deal with it to help to restore a healthy liver so um, name two liver cleansers milk thistle it helps with the detoxification of poisons such as alcohol. So it helps with regeneration of damaged liver tissue. It helps with stimulating the bile production and improves digestion because you have more bile to aid with digestion. Dandelion helps to stimulate bile flow from the liver. So remember, um, there are times when your gallbladder is not um, the if the bile is not flowing or your liver does not um, flow and, and produce bile to flow, down the line will help to stimulate that bile um, flow and often used to help fight fatty liver, even the last stage of it, which is cirrhosis of your liver. So down the line is quite, quite great here and important to use um, your dandelion teas and then you have estrogen dominance and even acne where dandelion helps with this. So again, estrogen dominance, such as in situations where you have um, fibroids, which is too much estrogen within the body, estrogen dominance. You also have, if you have a hormonal um, breast cancer, dandelion is quite helpful in this um, situation as well. Um, then you also have all, you know, organic turmeric, good turmeric, that is that yellow root, it's a cousin of ginger, it's powerful as a liver protector and even a liver cell regenerator. So remember the liver can help to regenerate, so the turmeric helps with that. 
it is it not only helps stimulate enzymes responsible for flushing out the toxins, which could also be cancer cause causing toxins from the body. Um, you know, turmeric also helps in re in breaking down that um, fibrous tissue or tumors and so forth, and eliminating it through the body. But there was a UCLA research that show that turmeric is capable of combating the effects of carcinogens as well. Uh, peppermint is um, it's useful for having fresh breath, but this herb also stimulates bile flow and releases the bile, relaxes the bile ducts and helps um, to break down fat. It also helps produce bad Reduced, it also helps to reduce the bad or LDL cholesterol, which makes the liver's job of filtering toxins easier. And peppermint also inhibits um, blockages in the kidney and the gallbladder and calms the stomach for optimal digestion. So any gallbladder issues, kidney issues, um, uh, where you have blockage within those areas, using peppermint can help with that. Um, two blood cleansers, so remember when you cleanse the liver, you also cleanse the blood. So blood cleansers are like, like red clover, um, which helps, to, it's a blood purifier, it protects against cancer. Um, it also great for balancing female hormones, such as in menopause situations. Um, if you have osteoporosis or bronchitis, red clover is great for that. Burdock root, this cleanses both the liver and the blood, and it's great for treating cancer and diabetes. Um, if you do have liver issues, making a castor oil pack, um, and the, the, this is where you get like a piece, like a rag or a piece of fennel cloth, you put castor oil on that, and then you put it over the liver, um, and then you add, um, you put like a light, cover of fabric over that and then you put a hot water bag. Um, the hot pack with that castor oil now would be absorbed through your skin getting onto that liver area. Um, if it's placed directly over the liver, it would help to stimulate circulation, detoxification and healing of that liver. And you keep that on just for about 30 minutes to an hour. You have activated charcoal. Again, this can be taken internally or applied over as a poultice over the liver itself. So to make this poultice, you have the activated charcoal. You mix that with flaxseed, um, broken ground flaxseed, and, and water. You mix it. You get a paste. You paste it on thick over the liver area. And then you, it would help to remove and pull toxins um, that's in the blood and to support the liver while it's being healed. And um, so proper digestion, um, it, it requires uh, a healthy liver, and it helps, it keeps your liver from being overloaded. Combine your foods properly. You have poorly combined foods will create toxins in your body, and some of these toxins are byproducts of fermentation of sugar or yeast and other pathogens used as a food source. Um, some folks have uh, jaundice. Um, let's look at this story. It's one thing to believe and to practice some remedy on oneself. It is something else, again, to care for a child. And so when Nathan, our firstborn, came along, uh, he was somewhat jaundiced, and the yellow-orangish appearance of his skin and eyes was due to the buildup of what? Bellerubin a bile pigment that was not being properly metabolized and broken down by the liver. So for various reasons, the liver sometimes does not kick into gear at birth and as it should have, um, as in the case of Nathan. And so out he went into the sun for a daily bath. Charcoal was also being credited for lowering bilirubin levels um, but since babies are only digest designed to swallow at birth and not chew, we mix some activated charcoal powder in a little water 
um, let the particles settle out. So you get what you call the, um, the charcoal slurry. And then we pour this slurry water off into a baby bottle, popped it into his mouth and allowed him to drink. After a couple of days and several ounces of slurry water, he later he was as healthy he was a healthy, broody, and pink child. Um, this is taken from Charcoal Remedies, um, page 27, uh, and I think it's Agatha Trash who actually was sharing this story here. And what two hormones um, does the pancreas produce to regulate the amount of sugar in the blood? The pancreas produces insulin and glucagon, um, glucagon raises the concentration of glucose in the bloodstream, and its effect is opposite that of insulin, which helps to lower the effect of glucose concentration within the bloodstream. So when it is that um, you, you eat, sugar levels would rise, and then as digestion takes place in that new way so often away, you find that your sugar levels within the blood will drop lower. The liver will now push off um, and produce glucagon, um, that, and so the pancreas also plays into this as well. But that helps to bring back your sugar levels back up and uh, eat with you feeling well and not faint and wary. So we stop there at that point, and the next time we continue, we will go on with looking at the small and large intestines on this amazing topic of anatomy and physiology.